this summer series of Psalms. And today we're going to be in Psalm 104, so go ahead and turn there with me. And what you'll notice in most Bibles, Psalms have little introductions. And in the little introduction of this Psalm 104, it says a meditation upon the majesty and the providence of God. Think about that word providence a minute. He provides. He's our provider. What we stand in need of, He'll provide. It may be a little bit after a while, but He'll do it and He'll be right on time. A meditation upon the majesty and providence of God. And it begins like this in verse 1. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, You are very great. Do you agree with that this morning? God is very great. You are clothed with honor and majesty. You know, we're talking about the greatness of God. And, and I want to talk about an English astronomer. His name is Fred Hoyle. And Fred Hoyle applied statistic analysis to the origins of life. And we're talking specifically about the theory of evolution. Okay, and here's why I want to start with this is because some people today are confused about how things were created. And I'm going to tell you how this created and the beauty of Psalm 104. It lays it out for us how God is the creator. There's no question. But if there's a question in your mind this morning as to how all this come about, how everything was created, or if you somehow believe that there must be some truth to this theory of evolution, I want to just set you a little bit straight. And so this English astronomer, Fred Hull, he applied some statistical analysis to the origin of life. In other words, is it possible? Is the theory of evolution even possible? And according to Hull's analysis, the probability of cellular life, and we're not talking about phones, we're talking about the cells in our body, of cellular life arising from a non-living matter, which is what the theory of evolution puts forth. That there was nothing there and then it just rose up. And by the way, that's called a biogenesis. A biogenesis. And he said the probability of that, listen to this number, is 1 in 10 to the 40th thousand power. Now that's a big number, right? And so then he realized that's such a big number, nobody's going to get it. So he gave this explanation as to what that number might mean. And this explanation is commonly known as Hoyle's fallacy. And here's the explanation. He says the chance that higher life forms might have emerged in this way is comparable to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. In other words, it ain't going to happen. He echoes his stance with this statement. He says, life as we know it is among other things dependent on at least 2,000 different enzymes for life. How could the blind forces of the primal sea manage to put together the correct chemical elements to build enzymes? It's impossible. In other words, this, this whole theory of evolution is just a theory. And I want you to understand that. I want you to appreciate that. And if that's not enough, let me layer on top of this one more thing. And it's called the second law of thermodynamics. You ever heard about that? <laughs> Basically, the second law of thermodynamics is a fundamental rule that determines the fate of the universe. Now, I'm just talking science here. This is what scientists believe, okay? And it, and it proves that we have a wonderful creator. The second law of thermodynamics expresses a fundamental and simple truth about the universe that disorder characterized as a quality known as entropy always increases. Disorder always increases. Simply put, by nature, everything is either running down, falling apart, or running out. We see that every day. I mean, you think about this. You think about, for example, something hot cools off unless you do something to keep it hot. 
uh, things deteriorate. New things become old things. Things deteriorate. Metal rusts. Batteries drain. People grow old and they die. This is the reality of the nature of our universe as everything runs out, falls apart, or runs down. It's the second law of thermodynamics, and you can't change that law. It's truth, and we all know it. So you say, why do you say that? Well, think about this. If the theory of evolution says that there was nothing, everything was in disorder, everything had fallen apart, there was nothing there, and somehow that composed itself into life as we know it, totally goes against the second law of thermodynamics, which says everything goes from order to disorder. Things can't go from disorder to order. So there's your little science lesson for the day. You say, well, why do you begin with that? Because we want to talk about the greatness of God. We want to consider that. And I, I just want all these other theories to be wiped away. Because what I'm saying to you this morning is that there is a God of the universe high in the heavens. And He created everything that we know. He created our being. He created the universe and everything about it. And this is what Psalms 104 sings about. And so let's begin there. And the first thing we see when it comes to the greatness of God is that God created all the heavens and the earth. Look at verse 2. It says, "...who cover yourself with light as with a garment." who stretched out the heavens like a curtain. He lays the beams of His upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds His chariot, who walks on the wings of the wind, who makes His angels spirits, His ministers a flame of fire. You who laid the foundations of the earth so that it should not be moved forever. So in those three verses right there, we see and speak of God creating the heavens. It said that He stretched the heavens out like a curtain. And it speaks of God creating the earth. It says, you who laid the foundations of the earth so that they could not be moved forever. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, understand that creation is not a past tense thing. God is still creating today. The heavens are ever expanding. You know when it says there that He who stretched out the heavens like, the, like a curtain? That was written thousands of years ago. But now all of science believe and, and they know that the heavens continue to expand out and press out. It's not that there's more heavens being created. It's that the heavens that God created from the very beginning are being pushed ever out and it, they believe it come from that initial Big Bang. And by the way, I don't have a problem with the Big Bang Theory. God spoke and it leaped into existence. That had to be some kind of noise to that, wouldn't you think? And ever since then, the heavens and all the universes have been pushing out from that initial creation of God. And science proves that, that we already had it right here in this Psalms. He stretches out the heavens like a curtain. They're continually going out. Not only that, but we see that the same uh, thought is echoed in Job 26, verse 7. It says, He stretches out the north over empty space. He hangs the earth on nothing. So millennia before we knew that the earth was round, before science had determined that the earth was hanging in the, in the universe, in the, in the cosmos, that He already had written in the book of the Bible that some people claim is the oldest book of the Bible, Job. He already had written on there that the earth is suspended in space. All we got to do is read God's Word and believe His Word. But the scientists have now proven that once again His Word is true. God creates all the heavens and all the earth. But not only that, God contains all the oceans and seas. Look at verse 6. It says, you covered it, and he's speaking of the earth, you covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the voice of your thunder they hastened away. They went up over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place which you found it for them. 
You have set a boundary that they may not pass over, that they may not return to cover the earth. Listen, day one of creation, God covered the earth with water, covered the earth. Day two, He creates the skies. And then day three, He got really busy. And the first thing He does on day three is He recedes the water to reveal the land. And then it says there that He has set a boundary for all the seas and the oceans that they may not cross. Now, I don't know about you, but I love going to the beach. I like going down to Destin and Fort Walton and places like that. And we've gone for years. We have many trips to the beach. And can I tell you that every time I go, that water is still there. It's still there right along that beach. It's still there on its boundary. It hadn't swallowed up Florida yet. California hadn't fallen off into the ocean yet. Hawaii's still out there in the Pacific. I mean, God has determined how far that water can go. At one time, it covered the whole earth. But then God, in His majesty and in His greatness, He planned it to have land. And we'll see that in a minute. And so He contains all the oceans and all the seas to their places. And He says, this is where you stop. And this is where you stay. But not only that, we see that God controls all the springs. We continue to talk about the control He has over all the waters. Verse 10 says, He sends the springs into the valleys. They flow among the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. By them the birds of the heavens have their home. They sing among the branches. He waters the hills from His upper chambers. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. Listen, what an amazing water filtration system God has devised. I don't know about you, but not only do I like going to the beach, I like going up to the mountains. And there's been times when Susan and I have gone and went up to the mountains and, and we've hiked way up into the mountains. And, and we get up there and guess what we see? We see waterfalls. We see streams. And it just seems like the higher up we go, the more you see it. And, and we're thinking, where's all that water coming from? Well, what God has done is He's devised these inner chambers in, in the earth. And that water from those inner chambers are pushed up through the mountains and it filtrates the water and the water flows down from the mountains into the valleys. And we receive that water, not to mention the water that rains, but a lot of the water comes from God's inner chambers. And that's what he's described in here. He controls all the springs. And it springs up in the wintertime. You go driving up in the mountains and you see all this ice on the side of the rock or the mountain where it's been forced out and pushed out. And it just freezes there for a little while. But soon it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, melt and it's going to run back down into the valley and our water supply is continually replenished. That's the greatness of God. He, he has this amazing filtration system. You know those inner chambers of water are the same ones that He allowed to be broken up to bring the great flood in Noah's day? Listen to Genesis 7, 11. It says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So when we think of the great flood of Noah, it wasn't just rain coming out of the sky. It was that God once again let loose all the water to cover the earth one more time. And then what happens? We know that story that He stays in the ark and all of life is wiped away. But, but then finally the ark comes to rest on a mountaintop. And the waters recede and they go back to the place to where God commanded them to go. And he said, I'll never do that one again. And we can even read in Revelation that the next time that the earth is destroyed, it won't be by water. It'll be by fire. And you say, do you believe that? You better believe. I do because it's the greatness of God. And he shares all his greatness with us. Not only that, but he causes all the growth. Look at verse 14. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth, and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart, 
The trees of the Lord are full of sap, the cedars of Lebanon, which he planted. Where the birds make their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high hills are for the wild goats. The cliffs are, for the, are, the, are a refuge for the rock badgers. Think about that. God causes all the growth for food, for shelter, for all of our needs. He brings about this growth on this earth. I mean, even today, if you build a new house today, guess where most of those materials come from? They grow up out of the earth, don't they? They're trees that we cut down and, and we slice into two by fours and we make into plywood and we build our homes and, and the birds build their nest in the trees and, and God causes all the growth and He does it for our sakes, for, for food, for drink, for shelter, for clothing. I mean, think about cotton. How crazy is that? Who figured that out? Here's some plant that's got this white fluffy ball and somehow they figured out how to make blue jeans out of that. And I'm so thankful they did. I love blue jeans, don't you? Yes. But He causes all the growth. But not only that, we see that He cycles all of creation. This is where it really gets amazing and really shows the greatness of God. Verse 19, it says, He appointed the moon for seasons. Now we know that's true. You ever notice the harvest moon? Isn't that a beautiful thing? It's like in the fall, at the very time that farmers would be getting their crops, it just so happens that God has created the cycle of the moon in such a way that it drops low in the sky. And as you're looking through the horizon, it's like a magnifying glass that makes the moon seem bigger and brighter than you've ever seen it. God created that. Why? So that farmers would have some extra light to get their harvest in. And so they'd work through the day and into the night and God gave them that harvest moon. It says that He appointed the moon for seasons. The sun knows it's going down. You make darkness and it's night in which all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar after their prey and seek their food from God. When the sun rises, they gather together and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. Think about that. Everything is on a sustaining, regenerative cycle of activity and rest. We see that animals come out and hunt at night. They come in at day into their dens and rest during the heat of the day. I know that we have deer in our neighborhood and, and we notice in the mornings you can see the dew on the grass of our front yard and you can see a trail going through it where deer had been out in our front yard early, early in the morning. But by the time the sun gets out and gets hot, they go into the woods and they just lie down and rest. But while they're lying down and resting, most men and women are getting up and going about their day and going and doing their business. All of this designed by God. Day and night, months and seasons, years and lifespans, all to the glory of the greatness of God. But not only that, we see, started in verse 24, that He composes all the story. It says, O oh Lord, how manifold are Your works! In wisdom You've made them all. The earth is full of Your possessions. The great and wide sea in which are innumerable teeming things, living things, both small and great. There's the ships that sail about. There is the Leviathan which you have made to play there. These all wait for you that you may give them their food in due season. What you give them, they gather in. You open your hands and they're filled with good. You hide your face in their trouble. You take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created. And you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in His works. He looks on the earth and it trembles. He touches the hills and they smoke. So we see that God just composes all the story. He brings life. He takes life. He provides what we need. He, he takes care of our food in due season and all those. It's as if we're actors all waiting on our cues from God. 
just waiting for us to tell us what's that. He's, he's not only the, the writer, but he's the director of life. And he has it all in his hand, all in his control. Remember that song you used to sing as a child? He's got the whole world in his hand. And he truly does. I think about Psalms 56, verse 8, which says in the King James, it says, Thou tellest my wonderings, put thou my tears in thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? That speaks of a book that he records of every tear that you shed. He's the writer of our story. I think of Psalms 90, verse 9, again from the King James. It says, We spend our years as a tale that is told. Once again, our lives are a story composed by God. That's why, uh, you know, Billy Graham, one of his uh, famous sayings was, uh, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Listen, if your life doesn't feel like a wonderful plan today, then you need to seek after God and say, God, I'm tired of my plan and I want your plan. Would you bring your plan to bear in my life? Would you take control? Would you be the writer? Would you be the director of my life? And He will. But not only that, he, we also see that He comforts all the saved. Think about this. If God is so great that He can create all the heavens and the earth, that He can contain all the oceans and the seas, that He can control all the springs. That He can cause all the growth. That He can cycle all of creation. That He can compose all the story. Then by faith, I believe that He can certainly take good care of you and of me. Amen? He can certainly take care of us. He can comfort all the same. This is why I can rejoice with the psalmist there in verse 33 and 34. He says, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be sweet to Him. I will be glad in the Lord. I will be glad in the Lord. Why? Because He comforts me. You know, as believers, God comforts us now, and He's also going to comfort us in heaven one day. I want you to listen as I read from Revelation 21, verses 4 through 7. It says this, And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. Mm. They shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The former things, been the things that we experience in this life, passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. I can't wait to hear those words come from my Savior's lips. Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. Forget all the theories of how this world was created. And put your faith in the words that are true and faithful. These words. And He said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. I give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things and I'll be his God and he shall be my Son, my child, He comforts all the same. But in all this Psalms, there's one little warning coming next. And the little warning is this, He consumes all the sinners. Look at verse 35. It says, May sinners be consumed from the earth and the wicked be no more. One day, God is going to consume the sinners and the wicked. But the, but the psalmist there says, may sinners be consumed from the earth. Could you imagine what this world would be like without sin? It would be a beautiful place. You know what it would be like? Heaven. It would be like heaven. But then to back up that morning, as I continue to read in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8 says this. It says, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, 
sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. He's going to consume all the sinners one day in a place called hell. It's an everlasting punishment. It's not in 10 minutes you burn up and you die. It's a punishment. And you say, do you believe in a literal burning hell? And I will tell you that yes, I do. And this is why. Because I believe that even if it wasn't, if it was something we can't imagine, that the only way that it could be described for us to understand the torment of it is to describe it as a literal burning hell. The torment of separation, eternal separation from God. God who says He's life. God who created all things, who created you and me. He is life. And so apart from Him is nothing but death. Apart from Him, this eternal separation is called hell. And the worst description that we can imagine probably doesn't prepare us for what it will be for those that don't accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Think about what Jesus said. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and what? The life. No man comes to, no man, woman, boy, or girl, comes to the Father except by me. He was saying, you need to receive me. He said so many things, he, so many names he gave himself. And Johnny, Johnny says he's the bread of life. And Johnny said he's the living walker. He said that he's the way. He said that he's the gate. He's the door. So he, he said it in every way he could think to say it that us humans could understand it. Basically, he's just saying, you've got to come through me. So if there's anybody here today that's never received Christ as your personal Savior, never humbled yourself and said, Jesus, I know I have to come through you. I can't trust in my riches. I can't trust in my good looks. I can't trust in my accomplishments. I can't trust in my education. The only thing I can trust in is you. And so now I come and I ask you to save me. I want you to be my Savior. And I want you to be my Lord. And listen, if you've ever prayed that prayer, it's that two part. You can't say that He's your Savior if you don't make Him your Lord. You can't say that you belong to Him if you don't live for Him. You can't say that He's your way to heaven if you're living like hell. You can't do that. So as we respond today, I want you to think about that and where is your heart and, and, and who is your Savior and what is your belief this morning and have you put your faith in Him? There's, there's one last little part to this that I haven't read yet. And it's the end of verse 35. And basically it tells us that God's greatness commands all of our praise. And we see that this psalm ends the way it began. And it says, bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. So what about you today? I love the psalms that sings the glory of God. And God is the Creator. He did make the universe and everything in it, including you and me. You say, well, Regent, why didn't He create us? Because we're to worship Him. He created us to be worshipers of Him. He created us to be loved by Him. And for, for us to love Him, for Him to love us, to have an intimate and personal relationship, he created us to give us joy and peace, to give us happiness and serenity. He created us to do great mighty things in and through us. And all we have to do is surrender ourselves to Him. So I would ask you this question. Have you surrendered to Him today? Is He your Savior and Lord? Has there ever been a time in your life that you've prayed, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I'm asking you today, Will you save me? Will you come into my heart? Will you forgive me of my sins? I accept your free gift of salvation. I know you took my sins to the cross so that I could go free. And I want to receive you today in my heart. It's a free gift. You have to receive it. You have to invite Him in. 
Revelation says He stands at the door and knocks. And if anyone hears His voice, let Him in. He'll come in and have an intimate relationship with them.